All right. Well, um, is there? Yes, good. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm going to talk about fuzzing with input to state correspondence uh, because our fuzzer is uh, it's a bit loud, isn't it? Because our fuzzer is based on AFL in uh, quite some details. We're quickly going to revise um, the way AFL works. So basically, AFL is a feedback-driven mutational fuzzer. That means we have a target program and some kind of seed corpus, which might, for example, contain the empty file or something like that. And AFL creates a mutation of this seed input and then puts it into the program and observes the coverage that this um, input triggered. And if this coverage contained any new code, then uh, we're going to save the input in the queue and uh, this process is repeated and inputs that do not trigger new coverage actually get removed from the queue. And eventually the fuzzer can thus learn evolutionary uh, what inputs are actually interesting and builds up a corpus of test cases. Um, yeah, so however, with current fuzzers, uh, I think you've got the wrong slides there. Um, with current fuzzers, there is uh, some roadblocks that uh, often hinder the fuzzer from continuing. So the most common example is something like this, where magic bytes are used, for example, in a, um, in a header or something like that, where a huge number, or like eight, four to eight bytes, need to be guessed correctly in an atomic check, and the fuzzer, well, it basically does not have a chance to guess that. Um, in a reasonable amount of time. And a somewhat more severe example is uh, checksums, checks, and sometimes you even find nested checksum checks where um, the input that would cause the crash looks something like this. And there's an outermost checksum which verifies the rest of the input, then there's an innermost checksum, and that actually checks the actual content. And uh, now the finding the actual content is easy for the fuzzer, but uh, for every mutation, the fuzzer has to solve all of the checksums on the outside, so AFL is unable to deal with that kind of stuff. Um, so there is a whole bunch of related work that tries to solve similar issues, and all of those indeed are able more or less to deal with magic bytes. However, uh, a large number of these approaches are not able to deal with checksums or even nested checksums. I would like my approach to be fully automatic, which excludes Flayer, which needs massive amount of human interaction. I like binary-only fuzzing, and um, I dislike precise environment models because they make it really hard to apply the technique, for example, for another operating system. And uh, this is why we see the need for something new. So what is that? Um, basically, the idea or the observation that we have is that programs often display something that we call input to state correspondence. And that is basically that the input value, or some part of the input, pretty much shows up in the state of the program in a more or less unchanged um, way. And um, we designed a fuzzer that exploits this kind of observation to solve the uh, challenges that we talked about earlier. So how does it work? Uh, let's assume, like I'm obviously, I like binary only fuzzing, so we assume this is a binary target. And we have some compare instruction that in this case implements a magic byte check that checks if some value is equal to the string A, B, C, D. And what we do is we identify all compare instructions. We place a hook at all compare instructions and then we take some input, in this case, for example, seed value, and execute the input with the hooks. And as the hooks are triggered, we observe the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the compare instructions. We do this not only for compare instructions where the right-hand side is a constant, we do that for all compare instructions, actually. And then we create a custom mutation that is specific to this exact input, which we can use, uh, in this case, to replace some part of the input because we know what was compared and obtain a new input that then hopefully, and in this case, actually solves the compare. However, um, there is obviously a whole bunch of issues with this uh, rather simple approach that crop up in uh, practice. And one of them is, well, stuff does not show up in the state. Like, it does sometimes, but not always. Uh, there's a whole bunch of encodings that are really commonly used by programs that we have to deal with somehow. Um, and usually people would be using symbolic execution for that, but we don't like that. So what you can do instead is simply apply the encoding 
on the observed value in the state and then use that as the mutation. Um, then sometimes we see compare instructions that are actually not used for equality checks, for in, but for inequality checks. And we can use the observed mutation or the observed values and derive mutations that will actually satisfy the inequalities by adding or subtracting one on the right-hand side of the replacement rule. Uh, then, I mean, we're doing binary instrumentation here that has the tendency to be quite slow, which is true. So in our experiments, typically we observe the slowdown of 10 times to sometimes even 100 times. So we cannot do this for every fuzzing execution because that would be way too expensive. Rather, we do that only for new queue entries. So um, like if you're fuzzing for a few days, maybe a week or two, then you will see a lot of executions, but you will still only find a relatively small number of queue entries. And then it's OK if you have 1,000 or 10,000 or maybe like 60,000 executions where you only have 10 executions per second instead of 1,000. So um, then so far, we only talked about compare instructions. Um, compilers are really nasty beasts. They use all kinds of weird instructions to implement compare instructions. Uh, so I particularly like the XOR and sub and add, that didn't surprise me that much. But actually, to use load effective address to implement a compare instruction did somewhat surprise me. Um, and we also hook all call instructions because we also want to solve mem compare and string compares and similar functions. And here we simply assume that the first two arguments to the call con uh, to the function that we're calling, uh, according to various calling conventions, so we just try all of them, um, are pointers. And if they actually point towards mapped memory, then we dump the first 128 bytes from this memory and treat them as uh, values that are being compared, which obviously finds way more comparisons than there actually are, but we don't care because we have like thousands of executions per second, so it's okay to have a few false positive uh, mutations. Um, however, there's a limit to that. So um, while building this, we ended up with inputs like this. So uh, for uh, file system drivers in that case, there's examples where the smallest possible file system that the driver will mount is um, is like 64 kilobyte. And it only consists of zeros. And now we have this mutation rule that says, well, try to replace the zero with uh, OX44, something like that. And now we have all the variants that I introduced earlier with the encodings and the plus one, minus one. Um, so that quickly adds up to lots and lots of uh, trials that we need to perform, which actually slows down the fuzzing process. So we came up with something that is basically a really low fidelity way of performing taint tracking without actually performing taint tracking. And the idea here is that we create another version of the same input that still covers the same, that still triggers the same path, but where we try to replace as many bytes as possible by random values. So we just try to spam random bytes into the input, and if they still trigger the same path, then uh, we keep doing that. And this gives us something which we call a colorized input. And now we observe the compare instructions from on the colorized input and on the original input. And um, there's far fewer candidate positions. And if we actually take only the intersection of those positions, then we typically end up with a very small number of candidate positions that we can actually use um, for fuzzing. So this actually solves the magic byte issue in, in our experience for most targets. I mean, this is obviously not perfect, but pretty good. Um, but there's still the checksum stuff. And um, there's been some other papers, such as TFAS most recently, but also Tainscope a bit earlier. Um, and all of those papers pretty much have the same approach as do we. We try to identify the checksum check with some heuristic, and then we just patch it out. Now, where we do something different from previous approaches is that um, this obviously leads to a whole bunch of false positives. And um, so previous approaches typically use symbolic execution after the fuzzing campaign to weed out false positive crashes. Um, but that has the disadvantage that the fuzzer will fill up the queue with inputs that are not actually triggering interesting coverage if you have a false positive patch uh, in the patch set. So what we do instead is we fix any new input as it is found. So before we add a new input to the queue, we actually try to fix all of the patched instructions using the input to state based method that we introduced earlier. And if that fails, 
we remove the offending patch and we discard the input so that we always have a queue full with um, valid inputs. Uh, lastly, like I've claimed that we can do nested uh, checksums, which happens sometimes. So for example, PNG typically has nested checksum checks. Um, uh, this has the problem where we need to fix the checks in the right order. And we do that by topologically sorting the dependency graph. So we can observe that if we change one of the uh, checksums, then some other checksums become invalid. And this gives us a dependency graph, and then we can topologically sort, and then we can use uh, the techniques for magic byte fixing to fix the checksum checks in the right order. So um, we implemented that, obviously, uh, in a prototype called Red Queen, which is based on KFL. KFL, as some of you probably know, is a kernel fuzzer that we developed earlier. Um, and that is why the target is actually running inside of a VM, because um, if you're fuzzing your own kernel, then you will lose a lot of crashes to your kernel corrupting whatever you use to save the crashes. Um, and also this makes parallelization on the same hardware easier and so on and so on. So there's basically three things that we need. We need to be able to get coverage. And uh, KFL does that by using Intel PT, which is a hardware accelerated uh, tracing solution developed by Intel, as the name suggests. Um, and we use that, and it's actually quite fast. It's uh, quite comparable, as we later see, to the uh, compiler-based instrumentation if you do it properly. Um, then we need a way to communicate inputs with the target, and we do that by basically directly writing them into the memory of the virtual machine. So the target has some fixed buffer where we just, like, from the point of view of the target, the inputs just magically appear. And when the target has consumed the input, it triggers a hyper call that uh, informs our fuzzer that a, new uh, that a new input is needed. And lastly, for Red Queen, we actually need a way to instrument the compare instructions. And uh, the way we do that is um, we use KVM uh, and we use KVM debug facilities such as placing breakpoints in the code and then configuring the VM control register such that the um, debug exceptions are actually delivered to us instead of the uh, program that's actually run at the target. And this is design allows us, we extended KFL to, to also target ring three programs and this allows us to target a whole bunch of different environments such as ring three or ring zero and, and different, in principle, different op operating systems. Um, obviously, we also used uh, our implementation to perform an evaluation. So um, the most interesting experiment, in my opinion, is the code coverage over time. And um, we evaluated against a whole bunch of related fuzzers that uh, aim to overcome similar issues. Uh, red green, obviously, is the red line. Uh, KFL without red queen patches is the dark blue line. Then we have uh, AFL Lafintel with Lafintel patch, which is the dark green line. AFL Fast is the bright green line. Wooser, well, that, um, okay. Uh, Kli, uh, symbolic executor. And lastly, Hongfuzz, but we used Hongfuzz in the Intel PT mode. Uh, so this is not the instrumentation based Hongfuzz. Um, and we evaluated that on. Uh, all of the bin utils that actually consume a single input file without writing to the input file. And as you can see, using input to state correspondence is actually quite helpful. We also measured how many executions per, sec uh, per second were performed by various fuzzers. And as you can see, our binary only approach uh, in the form of KFL is actually quite comparable to the compiler uh, based approaches. Um, Red Queen performs much slower, mostly not because we're like having a massive overhead, but because we find more slow paths. So as we find more and more coverage, the paths that we trigger are actually slower. Um, also, we looked at the different mutations that we implemented in KFL, so the deterministic phase and the havoc phase are basically one-to-one -one copies of what AFL does, um, as, as, as is the splicing mutation. And then we have uh, Radamza, which is a well-known other fuzzer which we also implemented, but as you can see, that wasn't too helpful. Um, and using input to state correspondence is actually pretty good bang for the buck if you count the amount of time spent and the amount of paths found. Though these numbers have to be taken with a grain of salt because input to state correspondence was the first stage that we used. Um, and therefore, it had a chance to find many easy uh, new paths that otherwise maybe some other paths would have found. Uh, and also, uh, input to state correspondence, typically we had like over the fuzzing campaign of the experiment, we had less than 10 minutes. 
of time that we spend in Red Queen because there isn't that much to do. Um, we also evaluated on the well-known Lava M data set. And as you can see, we found over 100% in all of the uh, targets. You don't really see that for unique, but in unique we found one additional bug. Um, and in most cases, we needed less than five minutes to find all of the planted bugs. And we even were able to find all of the bugs if we do not have access to seeds. Um, then we also found a whole bunch of bugs, which I personally think is a pretty bad benchmark, but anyway. Here they are. Um, there's been quite a few bugs in bin utils in the Linux kernel, which demonstrates that we're able to scale across various, um, various target environments. And also well-known programs such as TCP dump, image magic, FTK AAC, which is used in all Android phones for media decoding, and so on and so forth. So that's it from my side. Um, this is just an overview, so if you have any questions, please feel free to ask now. So I think I saw in like your evaluation slides there were a couple of programs where like the uh, Red Queen wasn't really improving on like here I guess yes. like CXX field and uh, yes. so can you comment on like why why that was the case? So I mean, Red Queen only solves specific kind of issues, right? It solves the kind of magic byte issues, and CXX field is a program that takes uh, strings that are encoded uh, that are encoded mangled symbols. Uh, for C++ and turns them into the plain symbols. And there's simply no magic bytes involved there. So it's just one byte checks all the time. So we cannot really add anything there. Okay, thank you. Hi, Eric Pauly, Penn State. Um, first of all, thanks for a good talk and thanks for including confidence intervals in your uh, evaluation. Oh, sorry, I didn't get that. Thanks for including confidence intervals in your evaluation. Um, yeah, a couple questions. So first of all, um, I'm curious, since you're sort of relying on a lot of these uh, I guess C language semantics. Did you right. did you analyze how your fuzzer would adapt to say an obfuscated executable? Uh, no, we did not. Okay. Um, oh. And then in addition, uh, at this point, we're kind of seeing that the Lava M data set has been effectively solved, right? Yes. It's in I would Angora not recommend and... anyone to use Lava M at this point yeah. for evaluation. Yeah. So so what do you think? What do you think that the next fuzzing data set will look like? I actually think that a large number of real-world programs with coverage is the best way to evaluate fuzzing performance. Because A, at least so far, none of the fuzzers are able to find bugs that are not covered. And B, all of the interesting behaviors also reflected in um, code coverage. So any kind of constraint that is actually hard to solve for a fuzzer is also a constraint that will result in coverage. Um, other than that, there is the paper by Michael Hicks. Actually, he's not the first author, but uh, on evaluating fuzzer, where he has a really interesting approach on evaluating fuzzers based on um, source control history, which I think is probably the best way to do. There's also the Google uh, fuzzing data set, which can be used. And I think CGC is actually somewhat underrated, because most current fuzzers focus on file formats, and CGC is actually more of an interactive uh, games kind of data set. So all Thank this you. would be valid. Hi, uh, I'm Gokul from uh, Arizona State University. So I had a question related to your patching. Uh, so do you assume that only the true would be evaluated, or you assume that only the true branch would be always taken for the patching? Or is it just you ignore the false branch as well? Uh, wait, can you repeat that? Sorry. So, do you, uh, so you said that in patching, you assume that all the true branches are taken. As in, yet you, as you, you patch it in such a way that it, it goes to the true path, or right. it divides to true. So do yes. you assume that the false branches won't have any bugs? Or? Well, I mean, we don't patch the jumps, right? So we patch the comparison, not the yes. jumps. Um, and yes, for the patches, we actually just assume that the interesting property is that the values become equal. Because for hash checks to be wrong, um, that's actually mostly not hard for fuzzers to, to manufacture. Um, and we do not like change the branching behavior itself, and we only we do not actually check if the comparison resulted in true or false. We just check whether there was new coverage in the end. Did that answer your question? Yes. Thank you.